and welcome to the Drexel Interview. I'm your host, Paula Morantz Cohen, and today our guest is Frank Wilson, a book editor of the Philadelphia Inquirer, as well as a poet and critic in his own right. Frank Wilson, welcome to the Drexel Interview. Nice to be here, Paula. Um, as book editor for a major metropolitan paper like the Philadelphia Inquirer, I imagine you get an avalanche of books um, every week. Uh, and I wonder, how do you sort, sift, decide upon what you are going to review? Um, sometimes I'm inclined to say, I sort of like put a black <laughs> on for darts, but um, yeah. obviously if it's, a, if it's a hardbound book, first edition, so yeah. on and so, from a major publisher, yeah. that gets priority. Okay. Um, but there are many of those too. Right. Yeah. Oh, there's about... Um, Probably 200, 250 a week on average. That many, yeah. really? Hardcover. Uh, hardcover, yeah. yeah. I mean, I put on the shelves about 30, 40, sometimes 50 a day. Mm -hmm. And then there's the paperbacks, yeah. um, which get short shrift, except yeah. every now and then one sneaks through. And sometimes, and you give more attention to a, an original paperback than you are. Obviously, I'm not going to review a book in paperback that I already reviewed yeah. hardbound. Um, but there is a trend now, isn't there, for books to be published immediately in mm, paperback? Yeah. 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 There, um, and then there's the, um, and you do get back issues, you know, classics and things. Sometimes yeah. you find something that you forgot you had read 30, 40 years ago, and you say to yourself, well, let's not, well, let's review that. Or there's, a, yeah. there, there's the, um, the anniversary book. We reviewed, um, uh, I think it was H.M. Pullum Esquire, the John P. Markman book. Oh, on its okay. anniversary or something. Uh -huh. I've run a review of that because I think he's a, a neglected uh, writer. I think he's a... Uh, Marquand. Yeah. yeah. I think the late George Apley may be out of print now. Yeah, that was it. I loved that book when yeah. I read it, I think, you know, in my early 20s. I also like the 20s. movie with Ronald Coleman. But Ronald I'm, Coleman, right. right. I'm a Ronald Coleman fan. So. <laughs> <laughs> Are you a Ronald Coleman fan? Yes. Oh, so is my husband. We'll talk about that later. <laughs> um, but uh, that, so, in other words, you, you think do you think of yourself as, in a sense, shaping public taste when you decide on the books? Is there that going through your head? I'm glad you asked that because mm -hmm. no, I do not. I don't <laughs> think of myself as a as a as a critical arbiter. What mm -hmm. I think I think of my role as a person who serves reading and readers in the broadest sense. I, I think. I don't like anybody looking down on anybody else because of mm. their reading material. If, if, the, if, if the book grabs the person and the person does that imaginative act that mm -hmm. you have to do to read, more power to them. So you're not a book snob? No, okay. quite the opposite. Yeah. Um, in fact, I find a lot of literary fiction less satisfying than genre fiction. Really? I find it better plotted, well, first of all, plotted. Yeah, uh, and alone. the MFA fiction, so to speak. You know, that's coming out of some of the writing workshops and so forth. Yeah, I yeah. have a problem. It's not, it's not that you're... Um, I remember reviewing one of those for The Times, mm. when I could review for The Times, which I can't do anymore, <laughs> um, and saying that the, the, the author had, that, uh, had his character thinking that writing a story was a lot like waiting in an airport waiting room. And uh, I remarked in my review that certainly reading this one was, <laughs> was like, that, was, that was, uh, it was yeah. like watching paint dry. Mm -hmm. um, too much um, attention to detail um, and no movement. Okay. I'd like to go somewhere. Yeah, I um, agree with you there. Is there a sense, though, of your trying to choose a real range so that since you talk about the reader, there is such a variety of, of readers out there? Um, do you make a concerted effort to span a spectrum when you choose books? Yeah, one, one of the things I try to do is I, I like to get, I don't always achieve this, I like to review a, a book of poetry about every other week if I can. Oh. And, That's unusual. And review yeah. it as a book. Uh -huh. uh, the idea that it, you should have, let's find six books of poems and, read, and review them all together and give each of them uh, 100 yeah. words yeah. is ridiculous. The Times tends to do that, I believe. Yeah. Uh, I, I, will, I will not you, say you anything You will not bad. say, okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but you review then individual books of poetry by themselves right. and give them their space. Right. Yeah. And actually we've got known for that. Daniel Hoffman, the former poet laureate, mm -hmm. sent me an email the other day saying that he thought that 
we reviewed more poetry than any other paper in the country that he knew of, really? including the New York Times. Really? And um, we've become known for reviewing poetry. We've become known for reviewing, for finding mysteries that people hadn't heard about. Mm -hmm. um, we are, so far as I know, the only paper that reviews has a, and every other week we review a young adult novel, which is a burgeoning yeah. market. An important market. An important market. It's very hard to find books for that age group, having one of those myself. Uh, myself. I, uh, yeah, I, I find that valuable. I also yeah. discovered that after I, uh, I had someone doing this, that a lot mm. of adults read them. Mm. And, well, uh, certainly the Harry Potter books have yeah. that and, um, mm -hmm. But I have a suspicion that people are listening to it because mm. the, the shooting up of audiobooks is incredible. I mean, there's, it's an, um, an immense increase in the number of audiobooks being sold. And why sold. do you think? Is it because when people are driving in cars, yeah. they're listening? Or yeah. they're filling in their day with right. that? With Multitasking, their right. Yeah. I think, uh, it's, a, it's a way of, uh, of getting... Um, and then there was that book by Ron McClarity that was originally an audio book mm -hmm. and then got published in Hardbound afterwards. Yeah, yeah, um, I remember that. But I th it's another one of the changes that's going on in, in our culture. We're becoming more oral. Mm -hmm. um, we're multitasking. People who read, younger people who read on the computer, read differently from old futzers like me. Right. Uh, they want to link somewhere. Not that you're an old futzer, but <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, um, you know, linking, moving back, um, and so on, and, and in blocks. Um, people who blog, I'm blogging, but it's too sporadic at the moment. Mm -hmm. Better to have it short and to the point. Little, um, Sound short nice. little essays. Yeah. Um, like those little, little essays that used to appear in papers decades ago. Now, you don't bemoan this change at all? I, you don't feel that there's a loss involved in, if you were to think about, getting books through audio as opposed to uh, reading them, holding them. Um, y y there's a different experience, obviously. Uh, you don't feel nostalgic for that I, th I think way? that if I think if you get people to read, mm. st you know, step one, get them to read, get them to experience what, how great that is, that it's an interactive process. It's not the same as watching a movie or watching television. You have to do a lot when you read. At least if you're talking fiction or poetry, you have yeah. to bring as much to it as you get out of it. Yeah. It's a, you go to a movie based on a, on, a, on a novel that you really enjoyed, you're disappointed a lot of times because you imagined it differently. Right. You were the co-imaginer of, of that. Uh, yeah. um, you'll probably feel that way if they make a movie out of your novel. <laughs> That's not the way I imagined it at all. Yeah. She's not like that. <laughs> no, I'd be happy if they make a right. movie, you know, at this uh, point at least, yeah. Um, so, and I think that if people get that habit, they'll turn some, you know, uh, they, they realize that if I want to read Joseph Conrad, I'm not going to read it on a computer screen. Yeah. I'm going to read it in a book. Uh, I think one, you, you can adapt. I don't think the one is, I don't think they're mutually exclusive. And you feel that just in general, reading, whether it's listening or reading, is just a less passive experience than so yes. many other things. That we yeah, did. that's the thing that yeah. bothers me. Since I became book editor, yeah. and I've been reviewing books professionally for 40 years. Wow. But I never have read more than I have since I became book editor. And what I realized, what I suddenly discovered one day that I've had a very hard time watching television. And that if I went to a movie, it had to really be good mm -hmm. and show that it was good very quickly, or I felt I was wasting my time. Uh, it's More so now than yeah, before. Yeah, mm -hmm. I just find that curling up with a book is a, lot, um, is a more fulfilling, mm. I, I wouldn't say an emotional experience, it's a, because there's more to it than that. It's an I agree with you. I, and unfortunately, unless you're exposed to it a lot, of course, you don't develop, you can't cultivate that taste. Right. And, um, that's, that's one of the problem. values in, in, um, in young adult books. Uh, I, I've occasionally encountered adults who say they have difficulty reading. They don't read mm. as well as they would like. I tell them to read young adult books. They'll be amazed at how easily they read them, and then mm. they'll move on to something else. Mm. That's, that's good advice. Um, you have been at the Enquirer since 1980. Yeah. Um, I was so given a 20 to life sentence. 
Um, but that is, you know, that is a length of time, and I imagine that you can gauge changes in taste over that time. Um, would you say, how would you summarize the, the way, the kinds of books that are being published, the kinds of tastes that you think have emerged over that uh, period of time? The most interesting thing is something that was told to me um, maybe three years ago at the BEA, Book Expo America, which is the, mm -hmm. the grand conclave of the publishing industry. I was asking various publicists what trend they had discerned. And I think, first of all, I think it was correct because I began to discern it myself, and, I, and it continues to be the case, mm -hmm. that strongly narrative nonfiction has sort of superseded fiction yeah. in the marketplace uh, because, because it has a narrative, because, because it sweeps people along. Uh, things, uh, but why has it superseded fiction? Do you think people want the real? Well, people want uh, people <laughs> want a story. You had better avoid long, descriptive, ruminative passages. Yeah. To do that and bring it off well, you've got to really be on, on the genius level. You, mm -hmm. you, it, if you're going to set out to be a writer, don't set out to be Proust or Joyce. Mm -hmm. That, just some advice to, uh, from me. Um, well, I do agree with you that right. it's liberating as a writer to not want, well, perhaps it's a slightly different point from what you're making, but to not try and be a great writer. Right. To not make that your goal, if right. you know what I mean. And right. Proust and Joyce would be to I think example. most people should do what they do because it's fun for, for them. Because it's fun, yeah. Right. And, and, and other people will have fun with you. I think that Joyce had fun writing. Yeah. Uh, I think that Proust had fun writing. Fun of uh, a sort. Whatever Proust could kind of fun. Proust right. <laughs> It's true, it is difficult. <laughs> not, not one of the fun guys. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Joyce, on the other hand, I think had a lot of yeah. um, But that, that, that's the... Um, so it, narrative nonfiction is, you would say, that's really emerged as a very popular it would, genre. It would appear to be. I mean, uh, mm. Walker and Company, it, that's practically what they, what they publish. Mm. They've just been bought by Bloomsbury, the pretty, primarily British, but also an American... Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, publication, as you would know. Yeah. Um, I want to talk, you say that you devote unusual amounts of time to poetry in the Enquirer, and uh, do you think that has to do with the fact that you yourself are a poet? Uh, actually, no. No. It has to do, okay. uh, it, it has primarily to do with the fact that I read poetry. Okay. And I think people ought to read it, that you get an experience from reading poetry that you don't get from anything else. Camille Paglia's new book uh, is, gives a pretty good demonstration mm. of that, though. What do you think you get from reading poetry that you don't get from anything else? Ah, uh, boy, you ask tough questions. <laughs> <laughs> uh, actually, I think I can answer that. Yeah. Imagine it's a, a day in November, late November. It's rainy, it's cold. You wake up in the morning and you feel blah. And you look at the window and the rain is streaking down the window pane and you think to yourself how weary, stale, un flat and unprofitable seem to me all the uses of this world. Mm -hmm. And suddenly it, it somehow brings it all together and you can go on. I don't know why the, that musical articulation of that experience by Shakespeare works the way it does, but it works for me like... Uh, it lifts you. Yeah, like a little prayer. Huh, that's wonderfully put. And, uh, and I think that's what one. The other thing about poetry is that it, when you read a poem, you, don't, you have to live with it. You can discover years later something about it. You're reading something and you realize, oh, that's what Eliot was alluding to. Mm. And you discover that and it becomes an, an integral part of your life in a way other things, that, you know, most prose you read from the beginning to the end and you, that's it, you move on. Hmm. But poetry you have it to. It sort of resonates in the brain. That's, yeah. that's exactly right. Yeah. To borrow a phrase from Alan Watts, it's like a pebble dropped in the well of the mind. Huh. And you, um, and it re and it ex that's exactly right. It resonates in you. That's great. I wonder if you would mind reading one of your...